Please open your Bibles. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 16. We're going to start it. Um, there's a footnote before verse 9, but we're going to be down at 14. Mark chapter 16, starting at verse 14. Pardon me? Mark? Did I say Matthew? I am so sorry. We're in Mark. <laughs> chapter 16. We're going to start at verse 14. It says, Later Jesus appeared to the eleven as they were eating. He rebuked them for their lack of faith and their stubborn refusal to believe those who had seen him after he had risen. He said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will drive out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes with their hands. And when they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on sick people and they will get well. After the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was taken up into heaven and he sat at the right hand of God. Then the disciples went out and preached everywhere and the Lord worked with them and confirmed his work by the signs that accompanied it. This is the Lord's word. Hallelujah. Well, can we give Jesus a hand of praise? Hallelujah. <laughs> One more time. Let's give him worship. He's so awesome. He's so holy. He's so worthy. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Listen, you all, it has been a joy. It has been uh, a sheer joy to have spent these several days with you. Uh, I've got a chance to, to talk with several of you uh, after some of the services, some of you in the cafeteria. Uh, it is just uh, exciting to see uh, what I believe God is doing in the lives of his people. And if we genuinely leave this place, uh, not only with information, but revelation about what and who we are, uh, literally we can change the world. And so I'm excited about it and I'm thrilled uh, to have been a part. And to all the leadership and for all those who put on and did all the logistics and all of the, the work behind the scenes, can we give God praise for the, the servants who served this week? Amen. All right, let's do better than that. Great job, guys. Amen. And for the many of you that have been watching by way of internet, uh, we just want you to know, God bless you, uh, technology is to be leveraged for the glory of God. And some of you have been watching faithfully uh, every, every session. Uh, many of you have been tweeting and there have been updates on Facebook and that kind of stuff. So just thank all of you who have been using uh, the internet to connect as well. Let's pray together. Father, we realize that uh, it is not by our might or by our strength that great things are done, but it is by your spirit. We pray now, God, that we would gain uh, in this time around your word a revelation of the mission of the church. Father, we've uh, had a time to look at really what the church is and what it's not, to understand, Lord, that we indeed have been called to be salt and light in a world that needs it so desperately. And then, Lord God, to be reminded that uh, the attitude that we need to have as your bride is one of submission. That when you speak, we say yes. And Lord, that we serve the Lord with gladness. That that submission is not obligatory, but it is with excitement and with joy. And then, Father, we thank you uh, that you have reminded us so much that, God, we must be willing to say that it's not about the I, but the we. That we are the body. And that we literally need each other to survive. If one hurts, we all hurt. And if one is blessed and one moves into their place, all of us are made better. Father, would you help us to not let last night be just one moment, but would you allow the, the work of your spirit to continue in our hearts as we now lay hold of that calling? And now today, would you realize, uh, uh, help us realize, God, the power of the church and let us realize the anointing that comes with our movement. We give you glory in advance for what you will say. 
And it's in the name that is above every name that we pray again. In Jesus' name, amen. I want you to turn to the person sitting next to you for one more time and help me announce the subject of our final session today, if you don't mind. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, neighbor. We, are we are on a mission possible. A mission possible. All right, now turn to the person on the other side and say, hey, you. Hey. Did you know you that you are on you are a mission possible? A mission possible. Amen. Many of you all may have heard the term mission impossible. Well, we want to talk today about mission possible. Mission statements are very important. As a matter of fact, uh, we started our church uh, now about 10 years ago. And I remember going to Detroit, Michigan, uh, my wife and my daughter and I, and, and not knowing one soul, not one person, and uh, gathering a group of individuals that we met over the uh, first few weeks and getting a core group together uh, that sat in the living room and began to dream about what a local church could look like. What would God do in our community of faith? And the first thing we began to say is, okay, what, what's, our, what's, what's our mission? What are we going to be about? What are going to be the things that regulate us? What are going to be the, the, the non-negotiables? In a sense, mission statements give purpose. Mission statements give direction. And Jesus is now, in this text, in Mark, getting ready to leave the earth. Uh, getting ready to catch a cloud and go to heaven and, uh, and and he gives us last words last words are very important uh, if you were uh, God forbid uh, uh, in an accident and the ceiling fell down on all of us and you were given uh, an opportunity to say one last word to your loved ones back home somewhere you would be very thoughtful about what you'd say you wouldn't be like close the refrigerator door I mean you know what I mean? You, know, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't say something crazy because last words would be, you would want to be remembered for the last thing that you said. You'd say, you know, tell my folks I love them. I mean, you'd be very intentional about the last words. Hear it. Now listen, here is the living word giving us last words. He could have said a lot of things. There were so many things that Jesus said that were significant. He could have said, don't forget to love one another as I've loved you. That was a very important word. He could have said, remember uh, to, uh, uh, to, to always give, to be a giver, and to not be selfish. That was things that he communicated. But yet, he gives us these words, and these last words are critical. Look what it says in verse 14. He says, he appeared to the eleven as they were eating. He rebuked them, first of all, for their lack of faith and their stubborn refusal to believe those who had seen him after he had risen. All right, so he appears to them and says, listen, others have given the testimony about my resurrection, but you've doubted it. He once again rebuked them for their lack of faith. Throughout the ministry of Jesus, the biggest issue was, where is your faith? Over and over again, he said, your faith is the key. It is your lack of faith that is continuing to cause problems. And you know what? The same words of Jesus then are now echoing through time to us now. It is our lack of faith. It is not God's promise. It's not God's ability. It is our lack of faith. And here's the question. Do you believe? Do you genuinely believe that the God of the Bible still exists? Do you really believe that he's the same God today as he was yesterday and will be forevermore? Has he changed in some kind of way? If you have faith, nothing is impossible to you. And there are many of us in this room that have a faith that is really more of a faith in religion or faith in religious systems than a faith in the living God. With God, all things are possible. Nothing is impossible with God. And he's the same God today as he's always been. And he's waiting for those of us who believe. And listen, you all, I pray that we can have a faith revival. That you would believe God again. I, I met a gentleman this morning on my way to breakfast that blessed my heart. Uh, we didn't get a chance to talk yesterday. He wanted to talk with me. He said, Pastor, it's all right. God already answered my prayers. And uh, he was talking about some things he was struggling with. And I began to share with him uh, as he talked about how God had answered. I said, you know what? God never asked us to be in the details. He never asked for us to figure out the logistics. And the majority of us that are crippled right now by fear, it's because you're trying to figure out how you're going to do ministry. Can I tell you something? That's not your business. It is not your business to figure out how. It is your big business to say yes. As you say yes, he figures out the details. Amen. Amen. Some of us are crippled by the paralysis of analysis. 
You think so much, you've thought yourself out of activity. Do you know how many, you know how many meetings you have? You have a meeting to prepare for the meeting. And then at the meeting that you prepared for, you then realize that there will be eight subsequent meetings to now give feedback to that meeting. And then after those eight meetings, then you finally get to the main meeting. And at the end of those meetings, nothing is still done. It would be amazing if we could actually, after the first meeting, just do something. Amen. Enough talking. Let's start doing. Tell the person next to you, enough talking. Let's start doing. Amen, amen, amen. Um, now, I rarely say this, but is it possible to turn me up in this monitor a little bit? Just give me a little bit more if, if I can in that so I don't, like, lose my voice because I, I feel like getting loud. That's, oh, that's good. Praise God. Because if I don't hear myself, I think I'm not talking loud enough, then I get loud, and you're like, Harvey, why are you screaming? So this works. All right, verse uh, 15. So this is what Jesus' last words are to them. He said unto them, go. Let's stop right there. Because we got a lot of deep people that, that want to, uh, and listen, I love, I, I'm in school again, and I'm, I'm taking some coursework, I'm getting another degree, and um, uh, I love the Greek, I love the Hebrew, and so for some people, they try to uh, do a, a verbal, uh, a, a word analysis of the word go. Well, what does go mean in the, in the Greek? Uh, what was the contextual context of the word go? Go meant go. In, in, in the Greek, it meant go. In the Aramaic, it meant go. Go in every language means go. And can I tell you something about going? When you go, you go. And you don't need a whole lot of teaching on going. Remember when you had to learn how to go to the bathroom? You had to learn how to control how you go. But you learned to go because whatever was in you came out of you. And for some of y'all, you just went wherever. <laughs> Imagine if the church would grasp the revelation of the goal that we are not called to perpetually talk about going, but to actually get up and do this thing and go. No, don't meet about it. Don't strategize about it. Don't go to it. Go. The world is waiting for a church that will stop gathering but start scattering. We have not been called to be the huddle, but we've been called to break the huddle and play the game. Go. 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 Well, where do I go? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> Into all the world. Now, what does this mean? Does it mean that now you got to start figuring out how you're going to travel the globe? No. It means that in the sphere of influence in which you have been placed, you've been called by God to make a difference in that space, wherever you are, to go into your world, to go into the place where God placed you, to know that if there's darkness in your world, you are the light and the solution to it. That if there is decay and immorality in your space, you are the answer to that space. To go into all the world and do what? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> and preach the good news. Proclaim the charisma. To preach the gospel. Listen, you all. <laughs> the world needs to hear the gospel. The world needs to hear the good news. Listen, you all. We've got to be careful about what we are proclaiming. Most of us are, have been uh, unfortunately duped by proclaiming things that are not the good news, that are not the word of God. Listen, the heavens and the earth will pass away, but the word of God will remain forever. It is alive and it is quick. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. The word of God does not return unto God void, but it accomplishes what it purposes and pleases. That means that the moment the word goes out, it will always accomplish what it pleases. Some of you in this room, you had a praying grandmother. Some of y'all in this room had a praying mother. Some of you all came up in a ministry somewhere where somebody put the word in you. And you may have strayed away for a minute, but you know what the word does? It has a hook in your back. And no matter how far you try to get away from it, the word reels you back in. And imagine someone that goes out into the world and doesn't proclaim prosperity, 
doesn't proclaim every day is a happy day because every day ain't a happy day but proclaims the gospel proclaims what thus saith the Lord listen you all you don't build your core on pizza you don't build your core on parties you don't build your core on programs you build it on the foundation you build it on the rock and Jesus is the rock and the word is Jesus in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory even the only glory of the begotten one of God listen it is Jesus who is the word and if we're building our lives on him then we must also build it on his word because he and his word are one and most of us, unfortunately, don't even have a Bible with us. How can you build your life on the Word and you, you remembered your phone but forgot your Bible? And what's so deep is that there's an app for that. <laughs> there's an app for that. You done got every other app going except the Bible app. What is wrong with you? How you gonna, how you gonna claim, I'm in the army, but I have no weapons? <laughs> I don't wanna be with you. <laughs> I do not wanna be next to you in the battle, and you out there talking about you representing, and you ain't got a weapon. But give me somebody that knows the word of God. Give me somebody that has the sword of the spirit. That no matter what comes their way, they've got a word for it. That means that when the enemy comes in like a flood, they said the Lord will raise up a standard against them. When depression comes, oh, I know one thing, he'll never leave me nor forsake me. When they don't have anything, and my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory. When your mama and daddy start tripping, your mother and father will forsake you, but I will not. Listen and when there's a word in you, you can, um, you can deal with any situation because you've got the sword of the Spirit. <laughs> Proclaim, preach the good news. And this is not for those who stand behind a desk and a book board. All of us are preachers. You don't have to be a person with a certain kind of outfit on. Some of y'all here, y'all are too struck by who are officers. Let me say that again. I thank God for those in leadership. But some of y'all are kind of a little too obsessed with that. I'm serious. Y'all act different. I was talking to somebody, all of a sudden they set up straight. I'm like, what's wrong? There's an officer coming. <laughs> I'm like, what's up with you? <laughs> Jesus was here before the officer came. <laughs> so why weren't you sitting up straight when Jesus was here? You do not have to be a particular person in the army to know how to wield the sword. Because every soldier, no matter what status they're in, has been given the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Preach. Proclaim. In other words, share. Share the good news. With whom? I'm glad you asked. With every people group. With all of creation. That means you cannot decide who you want to tell the good news to. See, some of us love to be in comfort zones. And we love to communicate with people that we think are easy targets. <laughs> in other words, you know what? I'm going to talk to somebody who I really believe is not going to confront me. Or I'm going to talk to somebody who's not going to kind of push back. But God has commanded for us to proclaim the gospel or to preach it to all of creation, not just the parts of creation that are most comfortable to us. God gets a kick out of uh, putting me in uncomfortable situations. As you've heard me mention before, uh, I, 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 it is difficult for me. And some of y'all will say, oh, pastor, that's not true. It is. It's difficult for me to preach outside of my comfort zone. I'm black. Y'all know that. We've established that. And my comfort zone is preaching to black people. You know why? Because black people always let me know if they're getting it. Black people, we're in a call and response kind of 
uh, dynamic. So when we preach in the black community, they say, amen, that's it, pastor. Yep, that's right. Yep, you know you're right. Hmm, I don't know. I mean, they let you... I mean, for real, they just let you know. So if you're on target, they let you know. If you're off target, they let you know. White folk, well, I don't know what you know. You just... And every now and then, there's the... Mm. And so I don't know if I'm making sense. I don't know if I'm connected. I don't know. And so I, I get in these environments, and God says, now preach. And I'm like, but God, I'm not comfortable. He says, I did not call you to comfort. I called you to go to every place that I've commanded you. And regardless of the environment and regardless of your comfort level, preach what thus saith the Lord. And what is amazing to me, it is in the places where I'm most weak that his strength is most perfect. And that is what God calls us to, not to comfort, but to places of obedience. Some of y'all white people are scared to go into black communities and be yourself. Stop trying to relate and be down. They know that ain't you. Hey, what up, homie? What up, bro? <laughs> now, if that's you and that's how you flow, we'll know. But don't try to relate. Be yourself. Amen. And if you black, stop trying to be something else. Hi, can I, I have some sushi? <laughs> you know you want some ribs and some. <laughs> you want some greens and some, you know, cornbread, you know. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Don't be trying to talk about some sushi. You'd be hungry as a dog. You'd get through. <laughs> somewhere they told me they're gonna take me to get some sushi I said you better take me to get something to eat I said I just got through preaching baby I need to eat something to eat I mean I thank God for the hospitality but I need something on my stomach all right so if you would ever be okay with you and realize that proclaiming the gospel is to all of creation then you will no longer be intimidated by the places that God places you some of you are in situations that are extremely challenging and you thought somebody made a mistake. And some of you all, and I thank God, one, I, one thing I do kind of thank God for the army about is you all put folk in, in stuff that some of them don't want to be in. Good, good. Because some of you all, you would comfort yourself to death. So get in an environment where you need God. When I left Chicago, you all, one of the reasons I had to leave was because, watch this now, hear this, is I, and it's gonna sound kind of scary, I no longer needed God. You're gonna say, well, wait, wait a minute, Pastor, what does that mean? I was at a church for 17, 16, 17 years and had become such a part of the fabric of the church that literally when I came out on the platform, people started clapping. And before I opened my mouth, they're like, preach! I'm like, I ain't even said nothing yet. And I found my prayer life decreasing. Because I no longer was afraid and I no longer said, God, I need you because I knew that the people were automatically going to accept me. And so God, in his wonderful sense of humor, says, now go to Detroit. You best believe every day I'm on my face before God because I don't know what's getting ready to happen every day. And maybe that's where God has you where he has you. Some of you resent where you are, but maybe it's by God's design. Because if you stayed where you were, you would be comfortable. And you would stop praying. Some of you all are saying, God, I need you because I don't know what's happening here. God, I don't know how to minister here. I, I, I'm, 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 not, I'm not at my strength here. Good. Now you can allow him to be at his strength. Proclaim the good news. Preach the good news to all of creation. And he says these words, and this blesses me. And he says, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Whoever does not believe will be condemned. And we're not going to get into doctrinal stuff about baptism because that's not the point. He's making this statement though. Those who accept the gospel, the good news, that Jesus is the Christ, the only way to God, those will be saved. And those who do not will be damned. We need to realize you all that there's a real, we talked about already, there's a real heaven and there's a real hell. And I wish that there would, there would be a conviction in this place over sinners who are lost. There used to be a time that our hearts broke for the lost. But we are no longer grieved by it. 
Some of you have family members that don't know Christ. You've not even called their name before God in months. And if they died and went to hell, guess what? Their blood is on your hand. Their blood is on your hand because you had an opportunity to give them the way out. He says, those who believe, they'll be saved. And those who do not, will not be. And you all, that is the same message today. That if we do not let this dying world know that there is a Jesus who loves them, they will be condemned. They will end up being in eternity without God because we refuse to be the instrument of God. We must tell the story. And the gospel is in your mouth. God in his infinite what power could have decided to write the gospel on the sun in every language and every dialect. That everybody who looked at it couldn't see the plan of salvation. Every time the sun came up, they could see how to be saved. He chose not to do that. He could have done it. He's God. He could have written it on every leaf that every time a leaf fell to the ground, when someone picked it up, there was the plan of salvation. He chose not to do it. Instead, he decided to write it on the hearts of man and place that message on our lips. The question is, how many have heard of him because of us? How many have not heard of him? because of us they're not going to just get it they're not just listen let me tell you what, what happened evangelism for most people is coming to our core come 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 so we hang out signs uh afternoon service and then we have special speakers harvey carey speaking like that's gonna really do something did you know that we're called to be fishers of men right you know that right Okay, how many of y'all know? Because I need some response. It's Sunday. I got a suit on. <laughs> how many of y'all know that we're fishers of men? Okay, good. All right. Let's, let's talk fish talk. When you have a boat and you're going fishing, is the way that you fish by, by leaning over the boat and announcing fish come here? <laughs> no, it has to be. That has to be it. You got to lean on. Hey, yo, fish. Come on up in here now. Come on. Come. That, that's, that's how they come, right? No. That, it's, oh, I get it. I'm sorry. You're right. You hang a sign. And you have the sign out. So when, they, so when the fish swim by, they'll see the sign and be like, oh, my gosh. I got to go in that boat. Right? I mean, there's got to be. Oh, I'm, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Programs. There's got to be some programs that are offered. So the fish can come in and they can, uh, uh, they can learn how to dance. Right? So the fish is going to have like a social. That, that's how they get in the boat, right? They have a social invitation, then they come in. The, no? Oh, oh, okay. Oh, oh, I get it. So the only way we catch fish is to put something on a hook and put the hook in the water where the fish are and then catch them and then bring them in the boat. They're not going to come on their own. You know why? The boat means death. You want me to lead a water and come in a boat? That means I ain't going to be able to breathe. Come on into our church. Right. We must go where the fish are. And we must compel them with the only hook we've got, which is the living, powerful word of God. And it is able to cut. It is able to discern the very thoughts of man. The word of God can go to the heart of the soul of man. It is the word that this world needs. Not more programs, not more socials. It is the living, immutable, anointed word of the living, holy God that this godless world needs. And we must take it to the world. <laughs> Proclaim the good news to all creation. And when they hear it, they'll be saved. And those who do not will be condemned. And let me spend my next 16 minutes and 15 seconds <laughs> on these verses. And this is going to bless me. I love this. <laughs> and it says, and these signs will follow those who believe. Now, I'm not, I'm, I'm not about to preach. I don't want anybody to start getting nervous thinking about the, I'm about to start preaching some weird stuff. 
because I'm not. And you all know me well enough now to know. I, I just, as a matter of fact, my church will hear me often say, I think weird is a sin. I think that weird Christians are sinful because Jesus was not weird. The, 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 I meet a lot of spiritual people that are very weird. You know what I mean? Have you met, have you met the weird Christians? The, I mean, in other words, they're so spiritual that they're just strange. You know, you, you, they can't even say a, 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 a sentence. Oh, praise God. How are you doing? How are you doing? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. How are you doing? Praise God. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. What? <laughs> you know, I mean, what, what is that? Or, or people that just shout unnecessarily. Hey, hey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Ah, ah. Okay, so why don't I see you do that in, in the store? I'll never see nobody in Jewel or, Dom, or Dominic. Hey, I, 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 I just don't see that. I don't see somebody in, in, in the drive through talking about, mm, ha, oh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I'd like a number one. Mm, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it just don't happen, man, so stop being weird. All right, if God moves, cool, but don't be too weird because it's kind of scary. All right, so, so I'm not going weird. It says, and these signs, watch this, this is important, will accompany or follow those who believe. In other words, God, when he gave the commandment or the mission to go, he said, now, I've got to make sure I give some insurance so that as they go, they will not be afraid in the going. And I need them to know that they're not going in their own strength but that I'm going to give them everything that they need for the journey. And these signs or these verifications that you are anointed to go will follow those who believe. Every believer has signs that follow them. And we ought to stop following after signs and let signs start following after us. The Bible says that these evidences will follow those who believe. Watch this now. <laughs> In my name, they will drive out demonic work. Demons, fallen angels will be subject to the believer. Listen, you all, let me tell you something. This world is filled with demonic oppression and possession. And it is not about you going demon chasing. I don't see Jesus being a demon hunter. He was not out there getting on horses and saying, all right, guys, let's go find the demons. That's not the mission of the church. And I see a lot of churches building their whole ministries on demonology. That is not the function. But let me tell you something. Let a demon pop up around a believer. The believer has authority, not in his name, not in her name, but in the name of Jesus to tell any demon, back up in Jesus' name and go back where you came from. Why? Because you have been given authority that in the name of Jesus, you can cast out demons. You don't have to beg a demon. You don't have to have a conversation with a demon. But in the name of Jesus, you can command a demon to go. I met a lady in uh, Detroit who came to me and she said, she's from New Orleans. She said, I'm from New Orleans, yeah? I said, well, okay. She says, and I believe in voodoo, yeah? I said, okay. She said, I'm going to put a curse on you because you, you called my son, you sell the drugs, and you took the drugs for money from him. And because of that, we have no money for our kids, and I'm going to put a curse on you. I said, really? I said, I've been redeemed from the curse. <laughs> the curse is every man that hung on the tree. Yeah? <laughs> you can't curse somebody who's been redeemed from the curse. And when you know who you are, you don't have to be pumped out by a fallen angel. Jesus is Lord. The devil is not like on equal with Jesus. Like we got Jesus in one corner and the devil. In, no, ain't no devil in the other corner. He is a fallen angel. And you have Jesus as your Lord. And you are co-heirs with him, seated in heavenly places, far above with reigning with Christ. How dare a demon talk about it's got power over you. So stop talking to demons. And know that in Jesus' name, you have authority to cast them out. 
I dare you to go in your neighborhood and have prayer walks. Stop, stop having meetings and start walking and start binding the enemy and start claiming territory. You're in the army. You know about scouting, don't you? Don't you know about looking at the territory and figuring out logistics? Why don't you get out the building and stop looking at census maps and start mapping in the spirit? Ask God to show you where the spot is. God will reveal to you the spot. And every community got a spot. You can be in the, in the country and it's a spot. It's a, little, it's a little place where they're making moonshine somewhere. You, it's a spot. Come on, don't look at me like that. It's some spot somewhere. And the Spirit will reveal to you the spot. And I dare you to start praying to Jesus. And praying that those demonic forces are cast down by his power. He says, in my name, you will have the power to cast out devils. Does anybody believe that? And not only that, not only that, you all, look what he says next. I love this. <laughs> you cast out devils in my name, and you will speak in new tongues. Now watch this. This is where people get confused. On the day of Pentecost in the book of Acts, this is not speaking about the angelic tongue that Paul refers to, that they're the tongues of men and the tongues of angels. And many people that have the gift of tongues currently are speaking about the tongues of angels, an unknown tongue. This is not talking about that. He's saying, I will give you the ability to communicate outside of your intellectual context. <laughs> I'll give you the ability to talk to people that you normally could not talk to because I will give you the ability to speak with a new tongue. I just got back from Brazil. They speak Portuguese. And as I preached the gospel, Portuguese people got it. You know why? Because God gives you the ability to communicate outside of your intellectual context. So you ain't got to try to be black to talk to black people. Be white. But know that he can give you the ability to speak in such a way that those who you're called to can understand it. Are you following this? You'll be able to communicate outside of what you've been taught and, and what you've learned academically. You have the ability to actually communicate in new ways. And for some of you, it's not verbally. Sometimes it will be artistically. God will give you the ability to communicate in new and innovative ways, even through technology. That's a tongue. It is a communication vehicle. And imagine those of you in the room who have been gifted with technological genius. Imagine if you could leverage the internet for the glory of God. Where the underdeveloped parts of our world who are gathered around cell phones. If you ever travel to Africa, they may not have food, but they got a cell phone. Imagine if you could be the vehicle that God uses to take the gospel to the world by way of the cell phone. Wow. Speaking with a new tongue. But not only that, you all, look what he says next. He says, uh, and they will pick up snakes with their hands. And uh, when they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them at all. Now, you all have seen these churches. <laughs> Man, you know, do your thing. I'm not going to be a visitor. <laughs> well, they got the snakes going, you know. I mean, you know, you come to church and you, you know, ready for Easter service. The next thing you know, they let the snakes out. Who let the snakes out? <laughs> joke that was good like who let the dogs out like who let the snake okay right. all right so they take these snakes out and then it, you know they let these snakes bite them and if they don't die then they've got faith and if they do die, oh no faith all right so that's not what this meant when the commission to go into all the world was given that meant that they were going to be going on the dusty roads of that terrain in that time and there would be snakes and poisonous vipers that would come out. And by just the nature of them traveling, they would get bitten. And he said, if you are out doing my work, and you are out doing what I've called you to do, you will be bitten 
by poisonous snakes and it will not kill you. And you will go in places where people will try to poison you and it will not work. This happened to Paul as he was on an island and they were watching, waiting for him to die and he did not die. Why? Because when you're on mission, the anointing will cause you to not die before time. Several years ago, about 18 years now, maybe a little less, uh, I, 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 I was at my church at Salem Baptist and um, uh, I don't know, I don't know if you know this, this relationship between preachers. Preachers like chicken a lot. Uh, fried chicken, it's like a, it's, it's just some kind of thing. I don't know what it is, but uh, on the eighth day, uh, the Lord made uh, fried chicken. And so, <laughs> I don't eat as much now because my wife is, is really like super duper health conscious. So I, I eat more baked chicken and broiled chicken than I do fried chicken. But every now and then when she ain't around, like, like around now, uh, <laughs> When I leave up out of here, I'm gonna find me some fried chicken. Right, so, um, <clears throat> right, so, um, so, uh, so I, after service one Saturday night, I decided to go with my family uh, out, and uh, we left uh, Saturday night and went downtown. At that time, it was a place called GameWorks downtown, and we went to GameWorks. And coming back from GameWorks, it's around 11:30 at night. Uh, I decided to stop by a place and get some chicken, and so I got a bucket of chicken. Uh, and I, I, I love my family. I shared chicken with my family. I gave them each a piece of chicken. And, uh, <clears throat> and I proceeded to eat the rest of the bucket of chicken. And so as I completed the bucket of chicken, knowing that I have a, uh, an early morning service at Salem that morning, we have a, uh, a 7.30 service, then we had a 10 o'clock service, and we had a, a 12 uh, noon service that was live on television. I, um, I, I knew in the morning uh, when I woke, my stomach... Uh, yeah, so uh, you know, the bathroom and I were, were getting very, very comfortably acquainted uh, for quite a while. And so I went to the first service and got through the first service and it went, you know, okay. Uh, and of course, I visited the bathroom very quickly after that. And then 10 o'clock, same thing happened. And so God, in his uh, unbelievable sense of humor, waits until the 12 o'clock service, which is live on television. <laughs> live on television. And so I'm up preaching. And uh, now I don't know if this has ever happened to you. Uh, cause there's a time where you, we talked about the first word was go. I don't know if you've ever been a time when you have to go. How, I know, okay, I know this is, okay. How many of y'all have ever been in a time where you've had to go? Of course you have, don't lie, do not. All right, and the rest of y'all are liars. Yeah, you come around. All right, so I am in the middle of preaching and I got to go. I mean, I'm in the middle. Of, listen, you know how I'm preaching. You see how I preach. So I'm preaching and I'm realizing live on television, I got to go. So, so in my mind, I'm thinking two things. Okay, either I'm going to let this happen here. <laughs> come on, I mean, honestly, come on. I'm live on television, man. Come on, this is for real. And if I do that, uh, the choir behind me is going to need therapy <laughs> cuz they gonna fall out under the power <laughs> and I knew I could not do that man I had no other suit I'm like I can't I, okay so I, I'm in the middle of preaching and I said I said you know what this is not about me Too often in Christianity, we depend on the preacher to bring the word to us. And you know what? I think it's time for you to bring the word to yourself. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to step away. And in the next few minutes, I want you to open the word of God and let God speak to you himself. I, I, may, I may come back. I may not. And I ran to the bathroom. And man, I, did, I never came back. Over the next several weeks, you all, um, I found that um, I was getting ill. I mean, I, I just was, this was not right. This was longer than normal. I went to the doctor. I said, you know what? You probably got a stomach flu. Probably just ate something that didn't, didn't, didn't agree with you. Go back home. So now it's into week three. I've not been able to hold down any water 
any liquids, any food. Everything is coming up out of me. And so I went back again, and they said, well, we need to take you in. And they went ahead and did that. And finally, they said, well, you know, you have a bacterial infection of some kind, and uh, we've got to uh, perform surgery uh, and put a J-tube in your stomach so that you will be able to get the medicine you need because you can't hold anything down. And uh, that's the only thing that will actually be able to fight this, and we hope this works. I said, you hope this works? They said, yeah, we hope, you know. And so they went ahead and they did that. And after it was over, they said, um, uh, for whatever reason, the medicine's not working. And I said, so what does that mean? They said, there's nothing else we can do. They said that we need to send you home on hospice. At that time, I'm down to 78 pounds. I have not eaten or drink, I have not eaten or drink anything now, and at that point in about maybe two and a half months. And so they left me uh, at home with a hospital bed and with a, a feeding machine uh, to feed me until I died. Uh, pastor Meeks, who was uh, my pastor, came and uh, was meeting with my wife uh, after this has gone on for several more months, maybe about another four or five months passed. And he had actually rented the University of Illinois Chicago Pavilion downtown, had rented it for four weekends for my funeral because he knew that it was going to be at least within that month that I would die. And so he's in the room talking to my wife and sharing with her about the funeral details. And I'm like, at least go to a room where I can't hear y'all. <laughs> you know, y'all know I can't move and fight or nothing. I mean, you know, I can't respond. And so I'm, I'm weak. I'm not able to walk. Uh, my, my muscles have now uh, gone, atrophy, gone into atrophy. I'm not able. Uh, my, my calcium deposits are gone. My bones are starting to break because of uh, now this has gone on for now close to nine, nine months. And so he's planning the funeral, and he said to my wife, well, you know what, it's time uh, for us to plan this, Harvey. Uh, you know, it's such a dear part of our church and community. We need to have a facility big enough. And she said, he's not going to die. Um, he said, well, you know, denial is the first part of this thing. She said, no, this has nothing to do with denial. Uh, my husband has been told by God that he's going to go to Detroit, Michigan to start a church, and this is not Detroit, Michigan. So either he's going to die and come back, or he's not going to die at all. And Pastor Meeks kind of saw he wasn't going anywhere with that, so he left. And so over the next few weeks, uh, my daughter, of course, at that time, she was about 11. She said, Daddy, are you going to die? I said, Baby, I, I don't think so. And I mean, my body was getting weaker. I was unable to speak at one point. I had lost everything, you all. I was down to bones. I was dying, literally. And uh, one night, my wife is upstairs sleeping. I'm in this hospital bed in my den. God says, Get up and get something to eat. I said, I haven't walked in now close to a year. He says, when I speak, I give you the power to do what I say. I disconnected the machine that was keeping me alive because the word of God was more precious than whatever I thought was keeping me alive. And I then made my way, barely. It took me about an hour, it felt like, to get to the kitchen, which was right here. And here's the sense of humor. What do you think? <laughs> was in the refrigerator. The only thing in the refrigerator. It wasn't, it was not fried chicken. It was actually chicken noodle soup. But I removed the pieces of chicken. Um, and I ate this soup. And I ate again, and I ate again, and I've been continuing to eat, and I'm in the American Journal of Medicine as an unexplained phenomenon. Because when you are on mission from God, not even sickness or disease can stop you. So I do not know what the devil has told you. I'm not sure what diagnosis has been given to you, but I came to tell you that you shall live and not die and declare the wondrous works of the Lord. The business is not over yet, and you've got too much to do. Debt cannot stand in the way. And he says, no deadly thing will hurt you. And so you all, I don't run after healing. Healing runs after me. Did you hear that? I don't run after healing. Healing just follows me because I've needed to get the mission done. He says, a snake won't hurt you. Poison won't hurt you. You worried about what people are going to do to you? I've had so many guns pulled out on me. I've got, currently I think I have eight debt threats, uh, which is really low. Uh, normally I'm using about 15 people trying to kill me. It's only about eight now. And that's real good. And I love it. You know why? Because no weapon formed against me shall prosper. 
See, listen, y'all. Whatever happened to the real Christians that have real enemies? I'm not talking about like people in the court that don't like you. You know what I'm saying? That's kind of stuff that you're talking about. Like, you know what? No weapon. Looking at people in the court. Formed against me shall prosper. It won't work. Now, you know, it ain't people. There is no demonic attack that is formed against you that will prosper when you're on mission. You know what the United States says? When they're in a battle, you have the full faith and confidence of the United States behind every soldier. That when they're in a foreign land, they can know that my government got my back. Well, I thank God that as a soldier of Christ, and as I'm out in the battlefield, I've got the full faith and confidence of the kingdom of God and the angelic host to watch over me and to guard me and to protect me in all of my ways. Amen. Imagine if you start being less punked out and scary and start being bold. Imagine if you stop being creepy and walking around like this, like, like somebody going to hurt you all the time. <laughs> Running into the core like you scared because it's night. Hurry up now, hurry up, let's get in the core. Close the door, you know. What? Imagine walking through the hood with some swagger. Like we run this, we claim this. This belongs to God, and this belongs to God's people. And you're not going to let grandmama and auntie over there anymore be victimized by you because the salt and the light just showed up, baby, and we running this. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. All right, I'm done. I'm over time. I'm over time. I'm over time. I'm over time. Here it is. Last, last, last verse. Because my, my little clock then went out, so it's done. It says, you should lay hands on sick people and they get well. You, you, you ain't got to worry about, like, trying to get medical plans all the time. Just believe God. Lay hands on sick people and they'll get well. After this, the Lord spoke to them. He taken up in heaven, sit at the right hand of God. And look what happens in verse 20, 20, 20, 20. They, they didn't have a meeting. After, after Jesus spoke, there was no meeting to be had. What are you getting ready to meet about now? You just heard God speak this weekend. Well, you guys, we need to kind of debrief. Okay, now let's get together and talk about what we heard Harvey say. And what do, we, what do you think about that? It says, after God spoke, then the disciples went out and preached everywhere. They stopped talking and started doing. Army, march. Army, move. Army, stop meeting and let the world see what the blood and the fire looks like. In the name of Jesus, rise up and be the church that God has called you to be. And the signs followed them everywhere and God worked with them. Confirming the word. Confirming the word. Confirming the word with signs that follow. Are y'all ready to take over the world? Are you ready to believe God to use you? Now listen, y'all, inside of your, uh, your program, if you can kind of get that out, uh, there's, a, there's a section in it that talks about your responsibility and some things that you would consider doing with the core when you get back. Some areas that you might look at serving. Any of you all that don't have one of those for whatever reason, if you don't have one, just kind of raise your hand if you don't have one with you. Everybody got it? Okay, good. All right, if you don't have one, see if we can make sure everybody gets one. I don't want anybody to not have one. If you don't have one, ask somebody. But over the next few moments, you all, listen, I need you to write down what your specific course of action is going to be. It's one thing to be motivated and inspired. It's another thing to put action to your inspiration. It doesn't mean anything to say, oh, wow, what a great time at the retreat. What a great time. That's, that's good. But this is what I'm getting ready to commit to do when I return. So as we spend some moments with some worship, uh, music, uh, kind of leading us in this time, I want you to listen. Don't just start writing, though. Just prayerfully 
discern what it is that God is saying to you. For some of you, it may be something very different. Very different. For some of you, it might be something that you routinely do, but you're going to do it in a different way. For some of you, it may be some questions that you're getting ready to ask so that you can begin to do something completely, maybe different than what you even thought you could even do. But whatever that is, I want you to just prayerfully, prayerfully begin to reflect and write down what the next action steps are for you. And this mission, you all, is a mission that is possible. Let's, let's believe God together.